The nasal cavities consist of two extensive chambers plus their associated nasal sinuses. The two main chambers are separated by a midline wall, the nasal septum. In humans, the nose has three functions. It forms a resonating cavity for the voice, it houses the olfactory organ that enables us to sense odors, and importantly, it is the upper part of the respiratory tract. As such, it functions to filter, warm, and moisten inhaled air before it reaches the lungs. The prominence and delicate structure of the nose make it vulnerable to a broad spectrum of injury, which accounts for why it is the most frequently fractured facial bone. The bony vault is a pyramid-shaped structure composed of paired nasal bones centrally and the frontal process of the maxilla laterally. The nasal bones are doubly at risk for fracture because they are protruding, but also because of lack of support and relatively thin bone. The maximum tolerable impact force before nasal fracture is approximately 30 Gs. These forces are relatively small compared to those required for other fractures of the facial skeleton. The next most vulnerable is the zygomatic bone, but it requires over one and a half times the force to break and it is not in as prominent a position. And superior, the supraorbital rim is one of the strongest buttresses on the face, requiring 200 Gs to fracture. There is no standardized worldwide accepted classification system for nasal fractures, so first I want to show the different types of nasal fractures that occur. The fracture type will depend on the patient's individual anatomy and trauma etiology, but these examples more or less represent the general categories. The normal diagram shows the bony pyramid with the ethmoid plate being the pole and the nasal bones being the sidewalls of the tent. There can be a unilateral fracture where just one of the bones fracture, bilateral where both nasal bones fracture, and this can also include fracture of the septum. Bilateral fractures can be of the open book type where the nose would be splayed out or the impacted type where the dislodged bones telescope and become depressed. Green stick fractures tend to occur in children before skeletal maturity. And finally, the comminuted type is when the bones shatter and is much more common in adults than children. You know, there's times when I'm not watching the fight like you are. You know, when you have, you know, two guys in there and they're fighting, you're looking at it and you're enjoying the contest as, you know, oh, look at that shot and stuff. And I'm looking at damage. I'm looking at seeing, you know, what's going on. And for, you know, for instance, to try to make it, you know, understandable, Robbie Lawler fights Rory McDonald. Okay, now everyone loved that fight, and they should have. But everyone was concerned about me stopping the fight either in the third round or in the fourth round, stopping the fight with Robbie being hurt and making Rory the winner. And everyone said, how close were you to stopping that fight? And it's like, you, you, no one understands. I was never really that concerned about Robbie Lawler in that fight. I was very concerned with Rory McDonald from the, the, about the fourth, round, fourth minute of the first round on. And that's my job as a referee. I'm looking at things completely differently than what the fan is looking at. What I'm seeing when I'm watching Robbie and Rory, Rory in the first round is landing more punches, but they're not real hard. Robbie's not throwing a lot, but when he's landing shots, they are thudding shots. They are heavy. And then he ends up breaking his nose in the first round. And you watch Rory. Rory starts, he starts doing what we call aspirating blood. Now, his nose is broken, and it's bleeding a little bit, but it's, it's bleeding down the back of his throat, which is not that big a deal. He can swallow all the blood in the world, and he's just going to throw it up. So it's not a big deal for me as the referee or for the ringside physician. It's not going to end up impacting him in life. But as he has that broken nose, he can't breathe through his nose now. He's starting to breathe through his mouth. And as he's breathing, breathing I can't even talk, breathing through his mouth, as he sucks in more air because he's getting more tired, as the second round and the third round, now he comes into the second round, he gets, gets a cut in his mouth. And he's got a cut that's now bleeding in his mouth. And he's in the third round, and he's really sucking a lot of air. And when he goes after Robbie, when he hurts Robbie, 
that's great, but now he's sucking a lot, and these little droplets of blood are now being aspirated, not going down into his stomach. They're actually going down into his lungs, and they're sticking inside of his lungs and stopping what his lungs can do as far as dissipating that oxygen to his muscles. And this is the thing that I'm worried about. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm looking at. So I'm watching it, and I'm looking at Rory. 90% of that fight, my attention's on Rory because I want to make sure that if he ends up falling off the cliff like he did in the fifth round when he got hit with a shot, it's not that that shot was the, you know, so you know, explosive and traumatizing that that's put him out of the fight. It was all of those things combined that brought this weight on him that he couldn't continue on in the fight at that point, and that's my job to get him out.